January 18th. This morning, the terms morning and evening, which I have made use of to avoid confusion in my narrative, as far as possible, must not, of course, be taken in their ordinary sense. For a long time past, we had had no night at all, the daylight being continual. The dates throughout are according to nautical time, and the bearings must be understood as per compass. I would also remark in this place that I cannot, in the first portion of what is here written, pretend to strict accuracy in respect to dates or latitudes and longitudes, having kept no regular journal until after the period of which this first portion treats. In many instances, I have relied altogether upon memory. This morning, we continued to the southward with the same pleasant weather as before. The sea was entirely smooth, the air tolerably warm and from the northeast, the temperature of the water 53. We now again got our sounding gear in order and, with 150 fathoms of line, found the current setting towards the pole at a rate of a mile an hour. This constant tendency to the southward, both in the wind and current, caused some degree of speculation and even of alarm in different quarters of the schooner, and I saw distinctly that no little impression had been made upon the mind of Captain Guy. He was exceedingly sensitive to ridicule, however, and I finally succeeded in laughing him out of his apprehensions. The variation was now very trivial. In the course of the day, we saw several large whales of the right species and innumerable flights of the albatross passed over the vessel. We also picked up a bush full of red berries like those of the hawthorn and the carcass of a singular looking land animal. It was three feet in length and but six inches in height, with four very short legs, the feet armed with long claws of a brilliant scarlet and resembling coral in substance. The body was covered with a straight silky hair, perfectly white. The tail was peaked like that of a rat and about a foot and a half long. The head resembled a cat's with the exception of the ears. These were flapped like the ears of a dog. The teeth were of the same brilliant scarlet as the claws. January 19th. Today, being in latitude 83 degrees 20 minutes, longitude 43 degrees 5 minutes west, the sea being of an extraordinarily dark color, we again saw land from the masthead and upon a closer scrutiny found it to be one of a group of very large islands. The shore was precipitous and the interior seemed to be well wooded, a circumstance which occasioned us great joy. In about four hours from our first discovering the land, we came to anchor in ten fathoms, sandy bottom, a league from the coast, as a high surf, with strong ripples here and there, rendered a nearer approach of doubtful expediency. The two largest boats were now ordered out, and a party, well armed, among whom were Peters and myself, proceeded to look for an opening in the reef which appeared to encircle the island. After searching about for some time, we discovered an inlet which we were entering when we saw four large canoes put off from the shore, filled with men who seemed to be well armed. We waited for them to come up, and as they moved with great rapidity, they were soon within hail. Captain Guy now held up a white handkerchief on the blade of an oar when the strangers made a full stop and commenced a loud jabbering all at once, intermingled with occasional shouts, in which we could distinguish the words Anamumu and Lama Lama. They continued this for at least half an hour, during which we had a good opportunity of observing their appearance. In the four canoes, which might have been fifty feet long and five broad, there were a hundred and ten savages in all. They were about the ordinary stature of Europeans, but of a more muscular and brawny frame. Their complexion a jet black, with thick and long woolly hair. They were clothed in skins of an unknown black animal, shaggy and silky, and made to fit their body with some degree of skill, the hair being inside except where it turned out about the neck, wrists, and ankles. Their arms consisted principally of clubs, of a dark and apparently very heavy wood. Some spears, however, were observed among them, headed with flint and a few slings. The bottoms of the canoes were full of black stones about the size of a large egg. When they had concluded their harangue, for it was clear they intended their jabbering for such, one of them who seemed to be the chief stood up in the prow of his canoe and made signs for us to bring our boats alongside of him. This hint we pretended not to understand, thinking it the wiser plan to maintain, if possible, the interval between us as their number more than quadrupled our own. Finding this to be the case, the chief ordered the three other canoes to hold back while he advanced towards us with his own. As soon as he came up with us, he leaped on board the largest of our boats and seated himself by the side of Captain Guy, pointing at the same time to the schooner and repeating the words, Anamumu and Lama Lama. We now put back to the vessel, the four canoes following at a little distance. Upon getting alongside, the chief evinced symptoms of extreme surprise and delight. 
clapping his hands, slapping his thighs and breast, and laughing obstreperously. His followers behind joined in his merriment, and for some minutes the din was so excessive as to be absolutely deafening. Quiet being at length restored, Captain Guy ordered the boats to be hoisted up as a necessary precaution, and gave the chief, whose name we soon found to be Tuit, to understand that we could admit no more than twenty of his men on deck at one time. With this arrangement, he appeared perfectly satisfied, and gave some directions to the canoes, when one of them approached, the rest remaining about fifty yards off. Twenty of the savages now got on board, and proceeded to ramble over every part of the deck, and scramble about among the rigging, making themselves much at home, and examining every article with great inquisitiveness. It was quite evident that they had never before seen any of the white race, from whose complexion, indeed, they appeared to recoil. They believed the Jane to be a living creature, and seemed to be afraid of hurting it with the point of their spears, carefully turning them up. Our crew were much amused with the conduct of Tuit in one instance. The cook was splitting some wood near the galley, and, by accident, struck his axe into the deck, making a gash of considerable depth. The chief immediately ran up, and, pushing the cook on one side rather roughly, commenced a half-whine, half-howl, strongly indicative of sympathy in what he considered the sufferings of the schooner patting and smoothing the gash with his hand, and washing it from a bucket of sea water which stood by. This was a degree of ignorance for which we were not prepared, and for my part I could not help thinking some of it affected. When the visitors had satisfied, as well as they could, their curiosity in regard to our upper works, they were omitted below, when their amazement exceeded all bounds. Their astonishment now appeared to be far too deep for words, for they roamed about in silence, broken only by low ejaculations. The arms afforded them much food for speculation, and they were suffered to handle and examine them at leisure. I do not believe that they had the least suspicion of their actual use, but rather took them for idols, seeing the care we had of them, and the attention with which we watched their movements while handling them. At the great guns their wonder was redoubled. They approached them with every mark of the profoundest reverence and awe, but forbear to examine them minutely. There were two large mirrors in the cabin, and here was the acme of their amazement. Tuit was the first to approach them, and he had got in the middle of the cabin, with his face to one and his back to the other, before he fairly perceived them. Upon raising his eyes and seeing his reflected self in the glass, I thought the savage would go mad. But upon turning short round to make a retreat, and beholding himself a second time in the opposite direction, I was afraid he would expire upon the spot. No persuasions could prevail upon him to take another look, but, throwing himself upon the floor, with his face buried in his hands, he remained thus until we were obliged to drag him upon deck. The whole of the savages were admitted on board in this manner, twenty at a time, to wit being suffered to remain during the entire period. We saw no disposition to thievery among them, nor did we miss a single article after their departure. Throughout the whole of their visit, they evinced the most friendly manner, there were, however, some points in their demeanor which we found it impossible to understand. For example, we could not get them to approach several very harmless objects, such as the schooner's sails, an egg, an open book, or a pan of flour. We endeavored to ascertain if they had among them any articles which might be turned to account in the way of traffic, but found great difficulty in being comprehended. We made out, nevertheless, what greatly astonished us that the islands abound in the large tortoise of the Galapagos one of which we saw in the canoe of Tuit. We saw also some beche de mer in the hands of one of the savages, who was greedily devouring it in its natural state. These anomalies, for they were such when considered in regard to the latitude, induced Captain Guy to wish for a thorough investigation of the country in the hope of making a profitable speculation in his discovery. For my own part, anxious as I was to know something more of these islands, I was still more earnestly bent on prosecuting the voyage to the southward without delay. We had now fine weather, but there was no telling how long it would last. And being already in the 84th parallel, with an open sea before us, a current setting strongly to the southward, and the wind fair, I could not listen with any patience to a proposition of stopping longer than was absolutely necessary for the health of the crew and the taking on board of a proper supply of fuel and fresh provisions. I represented to the captain that we might easily make this group on our return, and winter here in the event of being blocked up by the ice. He at length came into my views, for in some way, hardly known to myself, I had acquired much influence over him, and it was finally resolved that, even in the event of our finding Beche de Mer, 
we should only stay here a week to recruit and then push on to the southward while we might. Accordingly, we made every necessary preparation and, under the guidance of Tuit, got the Jane through the reef in safety, coming to anchor about a mile from the shore in an excellent bay, completely landlocked, on the southeastern coast of the main island, and in ten fathoms of water, black sandy bottom. At the head of this bay, there were three fine springs, we were told, of good water, and we saw an abundance of wood in the vicinity. The four canoes followed us in, keeping, however, at a respectful distance. To wit himself remained on board, and upon our dropping anchor, invited us to accompany him on shore and visit his village in the interior. To this Captain Guy consented, and ten savages being left on board as hostages, a party of us, twelve in all, got in readiness to attend the chief. We took care to be well armed, yet without evincing any distrust. The schooner had her guns run out, her boarding nettings up, and every other proper precaution was taken to guard against surprise. Directions were left with the chief mate to admit no person on board during our absence, and, in the event of our not appearing in twelve hours, to send the cutter with a swivel round the island in search of us. At every step we took inland, the conviction forced itself upon us that we were in a country differing essentially from any hitherto visited by civilized men. We saw nothing with which we had been formerly conversant. The trees resembled no growth of either the torrid, the temperate, or the northern frigid zones, and were altogether unlike those of the lower southern latitudes we had already traversed. The very rocks were novel in their mass, their color, and their stratification, and the streams themselves, utterly incredible as it may appear, had so little in common with those of other climates that we were scrupulous of tasting them, and indeed had difficulty in bringing ourselves to believe that their qualities were purely those of nature. At a small brook which crossed our path, the first we had reached, to wit and his attendants halted to drink. On account of the singular character of the water, we refused to taste it, supposing it to be polluted, and it was not until some time afterward we came to understand that such was the appearance of the streams throughout the whole group. I am at a loss to give a distinct idea of the nature of this liquid, and cannot do so without many words. Although it flowed with rapidity in all declivities where common water would do so, yet never, except when falling in a cascade, had it the customary appearance of limpidity. It was, nevertheless, in point of fact, as perfectly limpid as any limestone water in existence, the difference being only in appearance. At first sight, and especially in cases where little declivity was found, it bore resemblance, as regards consistency, to a thick infusion of gum arabic in common water. But this was only the least remarkable of its extraordinary qualities. It was not colorless, nor was it of any one uniform color, presenting to the eye, as it flowed, every possible shade of purple, like the hues of a changeable silk. This variation in shade was produced in a manner which excited as profound astonishment in the minds of our party as the mirror had done in the case of Tuit. Upon collecting a basinful, and allowing it to settle thoroughly, we perceived that the whole mass of liquid was made up of a number of distinct veins, each of a distinct hue that these veins did not commingle, and that their cohesion was perfect in regard to their own particles among themselves, and imperfect in regard to neighboring veins. Upon passing the blade of a knife athwart the veins, the water closed over it immediately. As with us, and also, in withdrawing it, all traces of the passage of the knife were instantly obliterated. If, however, the blade was passed down accurately between two veins, a perfect separation was effected, which the power of cohesion did not immediately rectify. The phenomena of this water formed the first definite link in that vast chain of apparent miracles with which I was destined to be at length encircled.